Hello viewers, I'm SB and welcome back to A House of Many Doors. So I was just uh, driving off in the direction of the cities to pick up some gunpowder to resolve our Bodox gaze problem, and uh, I was interrupted by an ominous noise. The floor of the house is shaking. You look behind, a bank of smoke and steam is rolling toward you. To be clear, we are south of the City of Masks right now, and headed northward, so... We're kind of going in the direction of the City of Keys, but we're still quite a few rooms away. Minus a thousand reputation is pretty... that's a pretty serious amount of reputation. What the? Uh... Who knows? Apparently red scorpiopedes. It seems like perhaps we're about to have a small issue. <laughs> what a time... what a time to go over my cargo limit. Uh, get, drop a golem. <laughs> Throw a golem in the engine, why not? Alright, uh, we should probably try to avoid these guys. I'm quite fast at this point. I wonder if it's if it's gonna be the case that we're just like, we're very unsafe in the area of the cities now. I'm like, extremely curious though, if we make it to a city, will we be okay to, to like, do business? Yeah, weirdly, things seem fine. Hmm, it's been a hard month. We had to spend a lot of money on repairs, and then Misery Guts fell ill and we were short-staffed, and Caro's Flag has put out a new drink that everyone's talking about, but we still turned a profit despite all that. Could be worse. Okay, yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, so, I guess, yeah. I appreciate that there are some real, actual consequences for the fact that, <laughs> you know, we, we've done all these horrible things. I'm a little surprised that we can still operate within the city if we make it to the city, though. Let's just uh, wander here, make a counter-argument. You know how I love a good counter-argument. We'll drop off a passenger, pick up a passenger bound for Icicle Spine. I oof, That's not a direction we're going. I mean, <laughs> welcome aboard, but that's not a direction we're going. And then gunpowder. Was it six gunpowder? Uh, unfortunately, that's going to put us way over on cargo. I mean, we could just shovel a couple more golems into the, into the thing. Uh, you know what we, you know what we don't need is Aranac silk. We can sell that. I am not going to sell my undreamt treasure. We have, we have other uses potentially. We can sell off our extra books though, and then we're going to end up throwing away some, some large amount of things. But I wanted to try to wring out some cash. Uh, so we need the gallows candles. Definitely don't want to sell those. Uh, we have a huge number of ancient grimoires. How much? We, we need to lose like 11 weight though. So we probably need to go a little bit bigger. Uh, nope, we need these trout. Yeah, I think it might, it might be just golems. We we don't really need golems. Oh, we have a lot of... I'm going to get rid of all these old bones. We have actually no use for old bones. And then... Yeah, and then golem. All right, that's got us. That's got us to a level that will allow us to move. All right, back to Bodox Gaze. I did not realize that this was going to get so dangerous. Uh, are we ready to hold on? Are we ready to summon the Salt Cove Queen? What is the what is what is the things that we're missing for that? So it looks like we're right up on this. We may as well if we're going to do it. Relic, warding iron. We need warding iron. We're in a place that sells warding irons, right? Don't don't all the cities sell warding iron? No, maybe not. Some of them certainly do. But I think that's the only thing there that we actually need. We totally have a sack of salt, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Uh, hunger that breeds. So we have a sack of salt. We have the three ga uh, gallows candles. We bought those. We definitely have occult relics. We have a huge amount of occultist paraphernalia, I think. So it really is just the warding iron. I mean, we could we could just go north. We know for a fact they sell warding iron in the city of Keys, and I sort of want to see if we can make it there at this point. I'm going for it. We're going for it. We're just gonna we're just gonna go hard north. We may have to uh may have to employ some evasive maneuvers, but I'm relatively confident we will get there. We are very fast, and these dudes are not. And also, not particularly smart in the way that they uh, try to steer around us. So it looks like it's always going to spawn three hostile trains from the various doorways of the room, or no, this room we only got one. 
I wonder if we could fight these guys for uh, potentially for factory goods. I guess there's no reason that. Oh wow, we have five this time. There's no reason that um, hunter killer trains would be carrying cargo. Minus one thousand reputation with this city of keys. Like just in case, just in case you didn't feel like you had really screwed things up already. It is weird that we did... Did we take a huge reputation hit when we actually did the heist? Or did they save that for when we encountered the ominous noise? Yeah, okay. They just let you, let you come back in and the customs men show up and... <laughs> Alright, I'll bribe them, whatever, I don't care. Okay, well we have some things to do here. So first of all, gather news. Secondly, we got some details to report. Still haven't managed to complete our assignment, and, you know, almost certainly won't. Uh, so, warding iron. We can buy a warding iron here somewhere. Yeah, there we go. Does that put us over? That does put us over. Can we sell something? I mean, I want to hold on to quite a bit of this. Okay, this stuff. We have some crappy enchanted gimmicks. How many grimoires do I have? It's probably a bunch, right? Eight. You know, just a casual eight. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, we'll keep one. Well, I mean, honestly, we could do the dwelling upgrade. Right, we have no guests to entertain. We've we've hung out with everybody. We're going to work on our magnum opus. Yep, <laughs> even less complete. You're not much of a painter, but you don't want your masterwork to be constrained to one artistic format. You begin teaching yourself brush strokes and resolve to buy a canvas. Really doesn't seem like a thing that's worth... I mean, if you just think about how much future we have left. I, I don't know, man. That doesn't seem like it's a good use of our time. Uh, we don't really need additional... Uh, additional ap apprehensions, I don't think. So I guess let's uh, let's just upgrade the lodgings. I'm curious what this does. You can gain one reputation, City of Keys. Cool. An old and imposing house on Revenant Street with a vegetable garden and even a small servants' quarters. Feels like a terrible. <laughs> feels like a terrible waste of money. All right, let's try to finish the museum since we're about to, about to burn through the rest of our uh, of our stuff. So wait, the undreamt treasure. Let me tab over to my log real quick. What exactly was it that we needed for the heart quest? One grimoire, one prism, one treasure. We do have all those things, and we're not that far from the goat stones. Yeah, all right, I'll hold on to it. I'll save it for him. We should we should put up some ooh a rack of pinned insects. We'll put this in here. That's pretty ish, right? We got some historical curios. Throw one of those in there. Was that was that our first one of those? Or do we, nope, five. Five historical curios on display, in fact. Uh, what else do we have that might be considered beautiful? Nothing, really. Uh, sure. A twisted lump of deform scab matter. It's going to end up being a very spooky museum, I think. That's just the beauty. We're not going to be able to make beauty happen. Uh, bordering on unacceptable. We can't afford any more scrutiny from the governor. Oh no, heaven forfend. Uh, so maybe try to take it easy on the occulty stuff. I got this dangerous beast. We'll put another dangerous beast in there. Seventy-three percent still. It really does. It takes a ton of stuff to finish this. That was another two. Uh, we need the grimoire for something. Primordial oddity. That's a pretty. We already had bunch of those, apparently. You know, there just aren't that many things in the game. Stoppered Bottle of Darkness. That's a new one. The lump of deform scab matter is a hideous thing, a twisted knot of Scorthidian's ancient blood. When you look upon it too long, you feel a cold pit open in your stomach. Is this blasphemy? No, I... Listen, I know what blasphemy is. You're gonna know it when you see it. <laughs> we're, we're gonna go and perform some, for sure. Uh, let's donate... I mean, I'll, I'll donate an Oscillating Prism. We need one more. Jesus, we, you need so many things to finish this. An Occult Relic? 
We had a hard time finding occult relics for a while, so I was leery about donating. Yeah, that was the first one of those that we did. Uh, our museum is 90% complete. It's also deeply terrifying. I'm going to put in some more occult relics. We're just, we're just committing to the occult relic thing. Alright, 100% complete. We have enough exhibits. If we pass inspection, we're ready to open. And if we don't pass inspection, then I assume the governor will be very mad at me. Uh, we have amassed an astonishing collection, thanks to you, says Ambrose, beaming. I'm sure our creditors, I mean, I mean, customers, will be delighted. I've taken the liberty of arranging for the museum's grand opening. The highest of high society will be in attendance. It will be very spooky, perhaps even, <laughs> even the governor. Boy, that would be something. Sure, let's open it to the public. I'm real curious what will happen. Many tiered cakes wobble past on rattling trolleys. Balloons colorfully flood the air. Fireworks light the city in gold and green and violet. Ambrose whirls effervescently from small talk to small talk. Elga lurks in a dark corner, sips wine, and glowers at the guests. She is way more my type. And what guests? Interest in the museum has been at a fever pitch for months, and now all manner of dignitaries have crawled out of the woodwork to investigate. Archbishops, aristocrats, and ambassadors swap anecdotes. MPs from the City of Knives mingle with shrouded counselors. You even spot the scarred Minister of Ghoulwatch. Ooh, fancy. As they all sit in the atrium for a glittering banquet, Ambrose taps his wine glass. Uh, before we begin, I want to hear a few words from the person who collected such fine treasures. The person who made this all possible. Uh, let's see. Well, gaining two reputation with the City of Keys <laughs> feels like a real waste at this point. That's not going to offset anything. I like this. I'm going to warn the audience that the museum is cursed and that it will bring doom to the city. The room fills with uncomfortable silence for a few moments before a red-faced Ambrose breaks the spell. <laughs> no, he, he says rather too loudly. No, that's, that's very funny, SP. The waiters bring out the first course and the musicians start playing rather too loudly. Finally, the dinner is finished, leaving a wasteland of crumbs and abandoned wine glasses. The dignitaries file out into their waiting carriages and scuttlers, after wandering the museum with interest. On its first day open to the general public, the museum draws heaving crowds. The magnificent exhibits are testament that tales of Espy's explorations are not at all exaggerated, opines the Septicivian Times, while the Hollow Trumpet declares it a five of five good time. The scholars of the Pauper's College are breathless with excitement, and you receive a flood of letters praising your efforts and asking for permission to study the exhibits in closer detail. We can collect monthly profits. Uh, we also got 10 Reputation and 10 Esoterica. Just as the excitement is beginning to die down, there is a knock at your door. Opening the door, you find a crate with a note pinned to it. Dearest SB, the note begins. I could not attend the grand opening. I was otherwise engaged. Matters of state occupy much of my time, I'm sure you understand. I came along the next day as part of the crowd. I was, at first, I confess, worried that I would disagree with my inspectors and be forced to close the institution. But no, I was most impressed by what I saw. Your efforts have exceeded my expectations. After some thought, I have delivered you a small token of my appreciation, an invention rejected from the factory for being too esoteric. I thought it might suit your tastes. I look forward to meeting you one day. That That's absolutely not going to happen. <laughs> I feel very strongly about that. Inside the crate is a kinetopede engine. A cheery jet of steam hisses from a pipe as though in greeting. There are half-burned books lodged at the bottom of the furnace. We got a philosophy engine. Is it better than my frost-rimmed dread machine? What a question. No, do we? Oh, do we not actually? Hold on, I didn't. I didn't click the button yet. We don't actually have it. Okay, now. Uh, it is. It is the same, except words can be burned for fuel. Interesting. Well, we find a lot of garbage books. Honestly, I think I'd rather have that installed. Also, this feels thematically appropriate for our character, especially given our, uh, the time we've spent with Nahash and everything. Uh, yeah, my sanity's not in a great spot. I suppose we could. So, we're not going to be able to sell stuff, right? Yeah, my 
My reputation is definitely below zero. <laughs> Visit my museum. Collect your profits. That's weird, apparently. We, I, mean, I mean, we have the grand opening already, so I guess there's money to be made. You know what? I am going to expand my dwelling. Why not? What else are we going to need the money for? Let's do the big fancy thing. Uh, an old and imposing house on Reven Revenant Street with a vegetable garden and even a small servant's quarters. Everyone who owns a house on this street is important, and the city watch patrol it rigorously. Well, that seems real bad for me. Ashen has taken residence in one of the bedrooms, which is fine. Can we... Yep, you can even... There's a level above that. Man, what would you have to be doing for it to be sensible for you to spend 130 gi Like, how much game would you have to play for that, for that to be a reasonable thing to do? Alright, we're, uh, we're doing a lot better on weight now. So, let's get out of here, I guess. This is probably the last time that we will ever be in the City of Keys. Uh, we don't need to advertise for a crew member or anything. Yeah, I think we're I think we're probably not taking on new stories at this point. I'm kind of curious. If we wander the streets, the Fungettos, that boy, has spread slowly over the years, inviting unflattering comparisons to rot from civvy and purity fanatics. Bulging columns and protuberances of moist vegetable matter colonized entire streets. The largest such communities in the city are Sootcap and Dungbird's Nest, but you have ended up wandering into Flea's Ear. Humans rarely come here. Much is made of the stench, but it's not especially unpleasant compared to the, fu uh, the fug of dung and smoke which hangs over the rest of the city. Flea's Ear smells of damp soil and old fruit. Mycenae have gathered in bewildering numbers. It's clearly one of the Mycenae's moral moots. Some of the elders must have had a disagreement. The entire community will have been invited to watch and participate in the debate. Comma, space, clinging to every available surface on their haphazard fungal structures. At the center of the throng, two Mycenae stand on a raised dais. So, uh, we could try to follow the debate. I sure do know an awful lot about Mycenae culture. One of the Mycenae on the plinth is a titan, a bile yellow column on four squat legs, nine or ten feet tall, but slender as a reed. The titan's rhetorical opponent is a red and pink thing the size of a child, but with a great funnel-shaped head that projects its booming voice far louder. The titan and the funnel seem to be debating a very fine point of ethics, peppering their quick speeches with bursts of spores which wash over the, com the crowd and presumably communicate some further emotions or nuances. But you can follow the spoken argument, at least. It seems to center on whether it is morally justified for a Mycena to borrow something with the intention to return it, but to never actually do so. The debate leaps from point to point at a speed unmatched by any human argument, but it repeatedly doubles back to prior points that you'd assumed had been settled, and lays them bare for examination once more. Every point of contention is revisited this way a dozen times or more before being settled. You never get the sense that the watching crowd are rooting for one side or the other, at a stage in the debate that seems totally arbitrary to you, both Funnel and Titan abruptly stop speaking and ask the crowd if they have any questions or issues to raise. A forest of fungal hands springs up instantly. Uh, I would like to get involved in this. This seems like a great idea. Any human who can ask a serious, appropriate question in a moral moot will be respected by the Mycenae community. I'd like to think I already am. After a flurry of back and forth that lasts for hours, the Funnel Elder finally points to your raised hand, conspicuously fleshy and human. I am surprised to see a human here, it declares in its boobing voice. You are not unwelcome. We need more humans at our moots if we are to foster true change. There are several bursts of spores among the crowd, which I'm hoping is a good thing, and a flurry of murmuring. The Funnel seems to have said something controversial. The Titan's face is inscrutable. Ask your question, then, thunders the Funnel. You respond to one of the debate's core points, approaching the matter as a Mycena would. You attack an assumption, but also raise the specter of a possible defense to that attack. And, to prove you've been paying attention, you draw on several prior moral moots that you heard mentioned earlier. There are a few murmurs of reluctant appreciation amongst the Mycenae, though most are silent. The Funnel Elder rebuts your point gently, spores filling the air as it does so. You've made a positive impression. You spot Mycenae in the crowd studying you, committing your face to memory. 
I do like the fact that it sounds like we made a pretty legalistic, uh, legalistic argument there. And uh, that's, of course, that's an esoterica check. It's all basically magic. All right. Well, with that, I think we are going to uh, gonna head up to not the City of Angels, but the uh, the Goat Stones. I mean, we could stop through the City of Angels on the way. So the Goat Stones are no, the Goat Stones are just hard. Yeah, we'll just go straight north. It's fine. We're still gonna have to dodge an awful lot of attackers, I'm sure. I suppose we could get involved in some combat. We're probably all in pretty good shape. And of course our train is terrifying to behold. You know, I was when I said that I was thinking about like statistics wise, but actually we are our train is now incredibly fast, unbelievably fast and covered in deform scab matter and it's, it probably is actually literally a terror to behold. We have huge mandibles strapped to the front of it. Don't forget about those. Frankly, it's a little silly, if we're being honest. I do I do think it probably would be more appropriate if you just couldn't perform any of your normal interactions in the City of Keys. Maybe like, um, maybe you get some special options related to you being a fugitive. Maybe you can still visit the black market and stuff. But it really doesn't feel like you should be able to have an interaction that ends with the governor sending you a letter that's basically like, hey, I think you're cool and impressive after you after you done the thing that we done. We never have actually gotten into con uh, combat with one of those floating rings of stones. All right, uh, let's go ahead and do the thing. Wait, did we, did we lose the option of doing the thing by talking to, man, I can't even remember what city that was. Was the, hold on, what is the name of that? It's called the Prince's, okay, the concern is just called the Prince's Heart, according to my notes. Did we resolve that by... Yeah, I guess we resolved that by talking to the people back in the city. I figured we could, you know, play both sides of the thing. Okay, well that's fine. We'll just abduct a stone. We do need a monolith for, um... We need a monolith for Cromlech's thing, so it was worth coming here either way. And then we will have a quick... A quick visit with our rhinoceros. And I guess with that, we're out of here and we're going somewhere slightly further away. We still... Boy, I still don't know where we would get a zoological specimen alive. We might have to get lucky again. I'm trying to think. Is there any place that we've seen them sold? Hmm. I don't know. All right. I think this would probably be a pretty good place for an edit because we're going to have to drive at least this far south. So uh, I'll see you in a second. Okay. We made it back to Old Hallow in one piece, despite some very slick maneuvering by some of the governor's agents on some of those screens. And I guess it's time to just summon the Salt Cove Queen. Here's the thing. At this point, my Kinetopede and everyone on board are total agents of destruction. Agents of weirdly sexy chaos. So... Let's do it. Let's summon some kind of terrifying sea beast queen, and then, like, there's like an 80% chance we're going to seduce it? I, I would say 80%. Let's press the button. Salt and chalk circles, candles, and in the center, a pile of oily, oozing fish. You hope the proprietress doesn't see the mess you made of her best room. Penpusher and Atheling and you sit in a, uh, each sit in a circle of your own. Sit each in a circle of your own. Kind of a weird way to word that, in my defense. Together, you chant. The ceiling falls away, and a roiling shape forms in the air above, vast as a cloud. An uncoiling mass of tentacles. A single bright yellow eye. A crown of spiked coral. Yet wouldn't be the weirdest thing we've had sex with. Then, with a smirk, Atheling scuffs his foot through the circle. <gasps> Atheling, you madman! Uh, so, a bold proposal, you are at a slight advantage. Attempt to salvage the summoning. Uh, don't we have like 110 Esoterica? This is a... This is a very difficult check. A very difficult check that we passed. 
Without hesitation, you scatter salt in a further triple circle around yourself, call upon Abja and Morbazar, and cut a great gash across your palm, spilling your blood across the summoning grounds. The mounting energies calm. The Salt Cove Queen could have been ripped in half, but you saved her. Atheling has gone ashen white. What, what have you done? He asks quietly. I never meant to actually summon... The rest of his words are cut off as the Salt Cove Queen's mouth closes around his neck. He falls headless to the floor, and a mass of roiling tentacles the size of a country tears the Old Hallow's roof off. She writhing above you, barnacle encrusted and salt caked and dripping brine, hundreds of miles high, hundreds of miles wide, all topped by a ring of mountainous beaks and a vaguely humanoid head. She doesn't speak, but then she doesn't need to. Images fill your head, an ocean world where the only land masses are spits of salt, a dozen portals to a dozen worlds, Karchar marching through them with tools of war, and a vast creature in the depths, broadcasting psychic commands to her army of slaves. Okay, maybe it's a good thing that we brought her here right as we're about to destroy the house, actually. You have summoned the Salt Cove Queen. Penpusher gibbers in terror. Her anglerfish eyes are focused on you. The Salt Cove Queen billows above you for a while, surveying you with her half-human, half-Piscean head. Is that gratitude on her face? Curiosity? Hunger? Lust? Then, in one great rippling motion, she is gone. You catch the tips of the last few tentacles vanishing through the door, far on the distance. The inn and its tree are in ruins. Penpusher is still moaning uncontrollably. You can hear the proprietress shouting below. Best get out of here before she realizes you're to blame. Oh, she will have gone to the Kelp Fortress, says Penpusher when he has recovered. I... I did not think she would be like that. You know, it said we lost a great deal of sanity. That wasn't really that great of a deal. Uh, here, we'll drink in silence a little bit. We'll just, you know, hang out at Old Hallow, which is apparently a thing I can do, despite the fact that I just did the thing that I just, that I just did there. You would think that they'd kick us out. I guess... I guess they never figured out it was me. Alright, so I guess back to the Kelp Fortress with us, then. Uh, where, where's the Kelp Fortress from? I don't even remember. Is it this one? Oh, that's Bodox Gaze. I mean, we do need to go to Bodox Gaze. Alright, I guess let's do that. We have all this gunpowder. Let me make use of it. Although, perhaps it would be a good idea for us to, uh, <laughs> for us to still have some gunpowder left when going to the Kelp Fortress. I don't know. We have, listen, we got lots of promises to keep. I have... I have, effectively, promised to destroy a huge number of things before I go and destroy absolutely everything. I wonder exactly what the deal is with, like, how am I going to destroy a whole room of the house with only six barrels of gunpowder? You would think that this would not be sufficient. Uh, escape to dream terrors. Get awakened, nerds. Maybe I should spend some of my many, many apprehensions before we uh, go into this thing where it's 658. Crimini, you really start acquiring them quickly after a certain point. Uh, no, we don't need to talk to these guys. So, yeah, 110 Esoterica. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push our graft way up. We should be really good at graft. That makes sense for our character. It is a shame that it looks like we're probably just not going to be able to uh, properly finish this quest. We should probably just go and do the version where you don't finish the demon. Because I would like to... Um, I'm also going to push our, uh, our guile up here. I would like to have done the thing where we, we potentially let something out of the house. Or try to get out of the house ourselves or something. So that feels in character. Uh, but I think I screwed up real bad by selling those factory goods. We might not be able to get any more. How many more? Jeez. Still. Still some is the answer. So we can get like 10 more stat points out of this. Oh, let me push my spirit. I can't believe letting my spirit languish here. Spirit's supposed to be a thing we're really good at. I suppose it kind of fits, though, that we, uh, we got away from it. It got away from us. We became fixated on other things and as esoterica took over our lives took over our, our life we sort of everything else kind of went by the wayside right that's pretty weird that the um the shadow of the gateway shows it as just two spires rather than it doesn't include the lintel 
don't think I'd ever noticed that before. I guess that would have been a real creepy thing if, like, every once in a while... Uh, I mean, the shadow thing is so prominent, right? If every once in a while the shadows for something were just, like, very wrong. Hey, an ancient grimoire that we can shovel into the engine if we want. Uh, apparently we're getting too close to the cities again. Man, we still have a ways to go. I'm surprised to see agents of the city out this far chasing us. We're really not particularly close to anything. So once we uh, once we complete this thing, I think we're just ready to go. I don't think we have any other major quests. I mean, we have to go we have to go south to Glitterberg for Dr. Vanch's quest, and I would like to complete that as well. But that's on the way, right? We don't have anything else that we need to veer tremendously off course for, I mean. Also, I do appreciate how fast we've gotten. I sort of wish I'd picked up some more of these speed upgrades a little bit earlier. Alright, a huge explosion will burn out the eyes. Perhaps that will be enough. You set the match to the fuse and run. All your crew take cover, huddled beneath chairs and tables with thick blankets over the windows. The flash is so bright you can still see it through the heavy cloth. The kinetopede rocks back and forth. And as a thousand eyes burn, you can sense, for just a moment, the gaze's consuming bittersweet melancholy. Its memories flood through you, fading almost instantly. Memories of tedium and torment and claustrophobia. And before that, a brief time of sunlight, then that too fades. When the brightness fades, the eyes covering the ceiling are gone, except for one. A solitary eye has survived, seeking refuge on your hull. It sits nestled in the metal, blinking out at you. Okay, that's proper creepy. It's a trophy. <laughs> the gaze sleeps. At long last, it is blind. So, first of all, obviously, teach a word to the crow. Secondly... What does that do? This increases grit. I guess that makes sense. Vigilance up. You know what? That feels appropriate. I do like our war trophy and everything, but... Alright, where the hell is the kelp fortress? Oh, jeez. Okay. Might be a good moment for a cut again. I'll see y'all in a moment. Well, I suppose it is time to receive our reward. I'm comforted somewhat by the fact that none of the words in this are in uh, quotation marks, but still, still like a little nervous. A tentacle the size of a highway lifts you gently into the air, lifting you up to the crowned half-human face of the Salt Cove Queen. Her mouth opens, a ring of endless teeth spiraling down her throat. For a second, you think yourself dinner. But no, she sings. A song that splits your eardrums and floods your mind in ice. Images flash through your mind. Mind slave Karchar storming across the house, laying waste to the cities and the Principate and the Chimeric Empire. A house drowned in seawater, every room flooded to the ceiling, human corpses floating in the pitch black brine. Is this a threat? A warning? Or an offer? Her face is the most inhuman thing you have ever seen. Lost all sanity. How many days before you can smile again? Oh, something tells me I'll be smiling very shortly. See, right there. It's just, I'm all smiles all the time here. High above, the Salt Cove Queen floats, a creature the size of a kingdom, its thousands of tentacles caressing the fortress like a lover. And then we just... You know, we had a quick we had a quick visit with our crow. No, this is definitely a rhinoceros kind of situation. There you go. The nightmares are receding. I'm feeling very normal right now, just extremely normal. Uh, and I guess that's it. Wait, we didn't even get like an undreamt treasure, or I, f I feel like we could I feel like we could have gotten a little bit more rewarded there. Oh, we're invited to attend a hammerhead's ball. This seems like a fine thing to do while my mind is completely shattered. The wide-faced hammerheads waltz between strands of dried kelp, singing together in a mournful dirge. Toward the end of the evening, they link their hands and focus. With the power of their minds alone, they send glittering dust floating into the air and concoct sweeping tapestries across the ceiling. 
Each vast new vista tells its own legend of battle or romance or blood in the water, and each is gone before you've looked at even half. After, they enter a feeding frenzy at the buffet. You stay out of the way, that seems wise. Uh, I guess I'll repair my hull while we're here. And why not? Wander the permitted dist districts. Uh, oh, right, the, the trial. Uh, let's, uh, let's return to the Kinetopede. I don't need to watch another execution. Uh, you know, we've seen one, you've seen them all. We'll study the Karchar language, I guess? We have so much reputation and knowledge and stuff. I do think it's interesting that in a lot of places where there are options locked by certain levels of currencies or stats... They show you the option grayed out ahead of time, but not always, right? Like, we didn't know about that Hammerhead's Ball option until we actually got past 8 Reputation. I wonder how they make the decision, which which thing is going to be which type. Alright, a strange little shop. It has been here a long time. Has it been? For a small sum, I will whisper, the young man says. I do not know what I will say. You could just purchase disquieting incidents. That's interesting. Uh, I think we are definitely gonna get out of here just to the absolutely the nearest place that we can regain some sanity. I'll see you in a moment. And welcome back to the City of Engines, where apparently there is no sound. The music died as soon as I entered here, and I waited a couple of minutes for it to come back so that I didn't have that thing happen again, <laughs> whereas where we had to uh, record a session without, or a, a part of the session without sound, and apparently no, it's just gone. The music's just dead here. That's fine. So I guess we're going to head back to the Hostage King, and we're just going to... We're going to tell him, too bad. You have to stay here and have a house collapse on you. Alright, Delgado tells us to kneel. We go ahead and kneel. We've seen this bit. Okay. So now, the gears in the Hostage King's throne rumble in something like satisfaction. Have you acquired the items that I need? The demon suggests that perhaps we are... Uh, Laplace, rather, suggests that perhaps we do, in fact, have them. But then... Then the tables, they turn. Now, you do realize the demon won't work, right? I've been thinking about this a great deal. Staring straight into his blazing eyes, you inform the hostage king that the demon will not help him escape, even if it is capable of calculating the current movement of every molecule in the house. That does not mean it can predict the future, much less control it. Indeterminacy rules all. Even if you run the same simu simulation with the same parameters again and again, it will be unique every time. Actions matter. Decisions matter. Paths and branches and intentions matter, even if they end up in the same place. There are always forks in the road, new patterns in old thread. The Hostage King slumps in his throne. Yes, he says finally. It's a truth I've been trying to deny for centuries. Dr. Delgado is staring at you in amazement. That's... It's very silly that that works, right? Because, like, we didn't make a compelling argument that his his deterministic view was wrong. We were just like, no, indeterminism is actually correct. We just we just disagreed loudly without any without any evidence or without attempting to make a uh, a compelling point or anything. And he was just like, yeah, no, I was wrong the whole time and I knew it. Okay, okay, well, so you'll stop building the demon then? No, says the hostage king. I will turn it into an engine of war. It might not be able to predict and control the future, but it can still make a billion calculations a second. Perhaps now I will finally be able to overwhelm the city above and regain my rightful throne. Two technic squid appear with a clap of thunder, their mechanical tentacles winding around you and Dr. Delgado. Go, says the hostage king. Leave me to mourn. Okay, well that's a pretty quiet resolution, I suppose. I mean, it's going to be a problem eventually. You wait up to the... Uh, or it would be a problem eventually if we weren't destroying the house. You wait up onto the rust fleck beach of Tarwater Bay. Dr. Delgado pauses to vomit a gallon of oil water onto his shoes. Well, that went as well as it could have, he says, wiping his mouth. The Hostage King is foiled. We should adjourn to the Kinetopede for celebratory drinks. He pauses, shading his eyes and staring at the sweeping searchlights. Do you know, he says, he always told us ministers that we were the best of the best, the greatest geniuses in all the multiverse. 
I wonder now whether maybe he only chose those who were gullible enough to believe him, and who had a predilection for the matter sort of science. I won't be fooled like that again, he says, shrugging and striding up the rusty beach. Outrageous ambition and unlikely promises shouldn't be enough to win my loyalty. Well, that's bad news for me. He's silent for most of the walk back to the Kinetopede. I shall continue to serve as your chief engineer for as long as you'll have me, he says, as you stroll beneath the shadow of a hovercog. Together, we'll find a way to escape the house. Just you wait. Yeah, in a manner of speaking, that is what will happen. Uh, so I guess, yeah, I guess we're done here. I don't think there's anything particular that we need to buy. Yeah, all right. Well, further to the south, then. You know, something I did seems to have driven all of the music out of all of the settlements. There was music on the travel from the City of Engines to Fargyle Keep, but as soon as I entered the keep, everything went dead silent again. Anyway, I figured we haven't been here in a super long time, and we might actually be able to become a poet knight now. Look at this. Distinction Poet, 50 Esoterica, and 50 Grit. Yeah, we, we have that under control. You're already a poet. All you need is a sword and a suit of armor. And if I have to kill a god in single combat, it seems like th those might be useful things to have, right? You meet with the three most respected of the poet knights, Sir Caliphus, Grey and Venerable, Sir Bruin, Leathery and Perfectly Quaffed, Lady Juliet, Sharp-Nosed and Muscular. You stroll together through the courtyard, watching the squires practice their archery. I don't know why I'm, <laughs> I'm having so much, wor so much trouble saying words with the letter S in them. Generally, those who join our order have trained with us since they were children, says Sir Bruin pleasantly. I'm sorry, Wanderer, but we cannot accept you among us. Oh, are you sure? I do have a way of winning people over. Apparently this is quite a difficult spirit check. A difficult spirit check that I passed easily. Lady Juliet is clearly not a woman who can be easily swayed by fine words, but your words are finer than most. Her cynical half-smile becomes something genuine as you make you case. <laughs> Very, very well. You twisted my arm. I definitely deserve to be a poet knight. Look at my, look at my literacy. I vote to accept you into our order. You would make a fine addition to the poet knights. Yay, I accept my knighthood. Hooray. A knighthood is a grand occasion, especially when the initiate is a stranger to most of the keep. A whole horde of knights, squires, servants, and scribes turn out to watch you make the long walk up the courtyard. As you ascend the steps, you are showered in scraps of torn paper, each with a tiny poem inscribed. You kneel before old Sir Caliphus, who lays his blade against your shoulder, once, twice, thrice. I dub thee a knight of poesy, he, he declares, which is a little bit like heresy and a little bit like poetry. Wielder of sword and pen, champion of honor and honesty, we sing because we can and fight because we must. Rise. After that, you adjourn to the pub, where the knights sing in your honor and feed you enough whiskey to drown a cat. That's probably not that much whiskey. Cats are pretty small. A rare honor. You are now a poet knight. Okay, and, and then we spend an evening with the poet knights, and it's... Okay, it's just the normal poet knight thing. Uh, hey, everybody, I brought some color dust. The rarest of things, a drug the poet knights have not yet tried. It is literally just glitter, but don't tell them that. The knights exclaim in wonder once they have inhaled the color dust. It's like green, but colder, more icy, says Sir Bruin, staring at the ceiling in wonder. It's the color that wine wishes it was, shouts another knight, blue. They're t what they're talking about is blue. For your part, you see strands of something like a purple-gold black twisting through the air. Only less friendly than purple, and brighter than gold, and duller than black. The memory of that impossible color will linger for days after, crowding all other thoughts from your mind. What wouldn't you do to see it again? I, I mean, I do have more color dust. The knights leave in dribs and drabs to sleep or train or compose, and I might have gotten myself addicted to color dust. All right, uh, hold on. We're going to... We're going to Glitterberg, right? Where's, is this Glitterberg down here? No, that's Scornvaunt. There we go. Okay, so it looks like, yeah, just one west and a bunch south. I'm not going to keep you all on for the entirety of the trip, but I just want to prove to you that there is still music in the house that I haven't... I haven't muted the game. See, look, we, we have sound effects. I don't know what the hell's going on. Any any time I feel like I'm about to start recording, all of the music has to go away. I mean, 
We have sound effects. We definitely don't have music. Okay, well, <clears throat> apparently there's just not going to be any music as long as we're recording here. So, uh, I, I guess I'll see you in a moment. Oh, wait. I finally lulled it into a false sense of security. Thought I was going crazy for a minute there. I mean, let's not jump to any conclusions that we're not. Anyway, I'll see you in Glitterberg in just a moment. All right, it's time for Dr. Vanch's moment of glory. Also, pleased to note that there's actually music in Glitterberg. Apparently, the, so the soundtrack is not vulnerable to the plague. Either that or the plague's not even real. At this point, it really could be either. I have improved my disease communication device, says Dr. Vanch, holding up something that looks a lot like a colander with test tubes stuck onto it. Now you will observe that this model is much more compact. You will. Fortunately, this means we need not actually bring plague aboard your kinetopede. You accompany Dr. Vanch to the quarantine zone. He presents his medical license to the guard at the barricade, who lets you through with a grunt. You are soon submerged in smoke-churned chaos. There are pyres in the streets, and bodies lie rotting in the open. Dr. Vanch sits cross-legged next to a fly-blown corpse and begins to undo the straps on his mask. I'm just gonna... I'm gonna let him... Listen, this dude's a doctor, presumably. Just trust him. I am sorry I did not tell you this sooner, says Dr. Vanch. I could not put it into words. The only way to talk to a disease is to infect yourself with it. He removes his mask, revealing that his once handsome face, the face you only glimpsed once, has been ravaged. His teeth have slithered up into his gums, leaving his mouth a morass of blood. His skin hangs in shreds from his cheekbones. At the very top of his skull, you see two white nubs poking through, the beginning of antlers. I hope you are not too shocked, says the doctor. It was necessary. For the greater good, yes? He tries weakly to smile, but he can't quite manage it. Uh, are you gonna die? Yes, I, so will everyone, eventually. You didn't need to make yourself a martyr. To be a martyr was exactly what I wanted. You know, it seems to me that it would be a little hypocritical for me to <laughs> for me to be too harsh about that decision at this point. Well, what are you going to do now? I'm going to infect myself, says Dr. Vanch, leaning over to the corpse next to him and swabbing at its boil-encrusted skin. And then the plague and I are going to have a very long chat. He puts his metal device on his head and sits there, cross-legged, eyes shut. A half hour later, his eyes open again. He speaks with a voice halfway between a cough and the buzzing of flies. What a boring man, says Dr. Vanch, although not. And this must be the famous SB. Moby has told me all about you, yes. Am I, sorry, currently speaking to the plague? I have infected entire worlds. I am Pestilence, the Horseman of the Apocalypse. I am Black Death. Kotawen Tawun Mal Contagioso, the Great Mortality. And now, here I am in this strange house. A house which I have roared through again and again, performing my usual task and killing millions. But you always come back. Ah, I was so bored of it, so alone. But now you, kind person, have come along and given me an excellent vessel through which to speak. So, a house which I've rode through again and again, killing millions, but you always come back. Is the plague aware of the time loop? He believed you had already infected everyone in the house, that you were just hiding your symptoms, biding your time. He was a madman, says the plague. Can a stone choose to sing? Can a man, can a man sprout wings and fly? Things cannot defy their true nature. I am the plague. And I cannot hide. I kill and kill and kill until I am stopped. That is the game we play. Are you going to let him go? No, I will not give up my vessel, says the plague. I can speak. Never before could I speak with you humans. I want to start by talking about your immune systems. Terrible. Of course, this human will die eventually, says the plague. I suppose then I will be silent again. Am I just going to ask him? 
I'm just gonna ask him. Hey, is this the, could you tell me how to destroy you? Yes, says the plague after some hesitation. But why should I tell you? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, because if you don't, I'll kill your human vessel? He might buy that. I, I wouldn't, probably. But <laughs> this bluff might work. If you don't, I'll kill your eternal vessel, and you can go back to eternal boredom. The plague is quiet for a long time. Mm, I became sentient by accident, it says finally. I was so destructive that a hundred billion worlds named me feared me, worshipped me like a god, until a god I became. But I have always been bored, and I am even more bored in the house. I used to jump from world to world, rejoicing in new conquests, but now even that small joy is lost. I could stop myself from spreading. As the last of the infected died, so would I. But why should I do that? The plague stares at you with hollow eyes. Choose your words carefully. Yeah, it's a good it's a good suggestion. Um Let's see. Because otherwise you'll be bored forever seems fine. Might be convincing. Dr. Vange was so desperate to save the world and become a martyr, now you have the chance. I mean, that does offer up a change of pace, right? Because it is the right thing to do, it's just that's not gonna work. Because otherwise I'll force you to leave your newfound vessel forever. This is basically the first option. Sooner or later humanity will find a cure. Do you want to go out now in a blaze of glory taking a city with you? Or end up humiliated, a toothless disease forced into extinction? That might work. Lord, just listen to yourself. You sound like you're performing the role of a bad villain in a children's play. You adopted that mindset because you came down with the mummer's frenzy. You know what? I'm going to say this bottom one. I'm offering you an escape. Because, like, that's the implication of a couple of these others. Let's just say it outright, though. Mm, you make a compelling argument, says the plague. Maybe this new body is influencing me as much as I am influencing it. Very well. I will agree to end myself. No one new shall be infected ever again, and the plague shall end in Glitterberg. On one condition. Allow me to keep Dr. Vance's body as long as he lives. Now that I have gained language, you see, I could not bear to lose it. Let me puppet him until he withers and dies. Ooh, uh... Save Dr. Vance, but just let the plague continue to run rampant? I mean, we're gonna kill the whole... We're gonna blow up the whole house anyway, right? But... It does feel like... Saving Dr. Vanch while allowing everybody else to suffer is not the way that Dr. Vanch would want it, probably, right? He he will be upset <laughs> if that's what I do, if he wakes up to me having done that. I'm going to allow the plague to stay in his body. The plague stands up and places Dr. Vanch's plague mask back over its head. I will continue to wear this to hide my strange appearance. And I will pretend to be Dr. Vanch to the best of my ability. I want the opportunity to observe humanity without being observed myself. And talk to me if you ever want forbidden knowledge. I know the secret intentions of crows. Listen, buddy, there is no way you know more about crows than I do. I know what happened at the minister's feast. I don't know who built this house, but I can make an educated guess. You leave, you leave Glitterberg together, you and the disease wearing Dr. Vanch's skin. Perhaps you will never speak to the doctor himself ever again. Perhaps he's gone forever. Or perhaps he is trapped within himself, watching and silently screaming as the disease flaps his mouth and moves his hands. Either way, the plague does a credible job of performing the role. You've stopped the plague from spreading beyond Glitterberg. And listen, honestly, if he is still in there, I bet it's less screaming. This is basically what he wanted. I mean, he wanted to eradicate the plague entirely. This is like 95% of the way to that. Sometimes even you forget that this is not the man you once knew. That's kind of a... It's like a little tiny bit of a cop-out, you know? Uh... Alright, the city's a hideous ornament, its people are dying, I... I mean... It's under control, don't worry guys, you'll be fine. 
Hey, here's a bit of unexpected good news. I just swung through Gross Fathom because we were really close to it already, and apparently this is this is a good place to get a zoological specimen. I mean, good place. I don't know. It's a place where we just did get a zoological specimen. So I think this means that we actually have all of the stuff we need to complete uh, Cromlex ritual. I don't. Can we do that on the train? Do we need to go somewhere in particular? I do feel like we should complete his story, right? If it feels like it would be really inappropriate not to. Uh, I will sell you my bizarre effigy, and then, yeah, let's just get out of the city. We should definitely talk to Dr. Vanch again, as well. Hey you, I would like some forbidden knowledge. You are the only person the plague can be honest with. This will increase your guts, and you'll also gain a glimpse of another world. That's kind of cool. I was, kinda, I was hoping that it would give us, like, a new dialogue option. Well, whatever. Let's perform Cromlech's ritual. And I mean, obviously, first let's... Hooray. You and Cromlech are in love. Sweet, sweet backgammon, if you know what I'm saying. Cromlech lights the candles and ties the squealing animal to the monolith, fills his room with the gnawing darkness. You hand him your knife and he accepts in silence. He cuts himself, draws symbols on the floor and walls in blood. Then he disembowels the animal, holds its viscera above his head, and chants his praises to the pale, the light within darkness, the stone cradle. Gained one zoological specimen, dead. Yeah, I should probably join in. Can the human join a Goatman ritual? Will you see his visions? Taste his dreams? Yeah, sure thing, no problem. You and Cromlech cavort in blood together, as we have so many times before. Singing, chanting, cutting yourselves. You collapse in tandem, and the visions fill your mind in a thudding migraine whirl. Nine dead worlds, each as black and sterile as coal, orbit a blood-red sun. A beach at night, sand cool beneath your bare feet, and above you there are teeth in the dark sky. They are pale and huge as mountains. They are descending. The sea boils. You are out in the infinite void again, and a giantess the size of a galaxy bites into the world. Its lights die as she devours it, clouds stripped away, seas turning to steam. Billions die. A seething loathing fills your bones like hot cement. And then you wake. You wake together in the middle of a sickening mess. Whatever strange impulse overtook you, it's gone now. But Cromlech still seems deep in its embrace. He jumps on top of you, hands clasping your throat. Criminals, he spits, drool hanging from his chin. Sinners, your crime is remembered at last. Fingers tighten. Cromlech's eyes are glazed and merciless. Uh, I think... I mean, our character's a talker, right? Try to talk him down. His fingers tighten further still, cutting off your words. I kind of thought that might happen. All right, shove him off. Oh, dear. It's not hard to shove him off. He scrambles into the corner, whimpering. Murderer, he, whispers, he hisses. Monster, I saw your crime. The shame of your race. Minus 2,000 relationship. Okay, buddy, come on. Hey, it's, it's me, your very close personal friend. He squats in the corner, clutching his head and snarling. He does not respond to you at all. You spot Cromlech's diary sitting on the edge of his table, the only document he hasn't yet shredded. Some impulse makes you take it. You leave him cowering and snarling in his room. Nothing will entice him to leave. He has become a screaming, feral recluse. The diary is written in sweeping purple prose. The last pages try to reconcile Cromlech's goatman heritage which, with his love for humanity. You know, humanity. The very last page is just a dense, scrawled rant. But in earlier passages, that love of humanity is in full evidence. He writes about his favorite cities in a tome that borders on worshipful. He rhapsodizes about the bright pageantry of Founder's Fire, the gloomy grandeur of Ghoul Watch, the coffee houses and theaters in the City of Masks. He writes about the poet knights with untempered admiration, praising their bravery and artistry. And then there are the passages he's written about you and the wonderful times you spent together. He scrawled hearts and flowers in the margin like some schoolgirl. He's very sweet. He writes in a tone of breathless wonder, as though he can't quite believe that you're real, that he can touch you and kiss you, and make pancakes for you. 
It's a mystifying contrast to the growling animal who now paces back and forth in his room. Yeah, this is... this has turned into a real thing, huh? Penpusher, could you maybe speak with him? Cromluck refuses to speak with a human, but other species seem fine. I really like this. I, I ba Basically, I like it any time one of the storylines branches into the other parts of the world, right? Cromlech spits and fights when a human enters his room, shouting, ancient, uh, shouting about ancient crimes. But he seems to accept P uh, Penpusher's presence calmly. They talk for hours, and when he leaves, Penpusher is subdued, as he often is. I told him that humanity is wonderful. I don't know if I got through to him, but he seemed a little better toward the end. That evening, Cromlech actually comes out for dinner, though he retreats to his room with the food. Well, it's a start. Is this going to go somewhere, or do we have... I mean, it's a little heartbreaking, honestly. Uh, the Rebellion of Stones. Okay. Well, you know what? I guess we're, uh, I guess we're veering off the big quest for the moment. I, it's very important to me that we restore Cromlech, for reasons that I hope are pretty clear to everybody. So, back to Founder's Fire? Oh, it says, it says just one of the, it says or. We're not that far from Fargyle Keep. We can do that. Oh great, and now our engine's getting cantankerous. The philosophy engine has shut down and entirely refuses to provide any further propulsion. Apparently it lost to Dr. Delgado in a debate, although how this debate was conducted is entirely beyond your realm of understanding, and it is now sulking. No degree of threat, cajoling, promise, or compromise proves sufficient. In the end, you resort to sending Dr. Delgado back down to the engine room under strict instructions to lose the debate this time. You spend three days soothing your engine's wounded ego. But my suspicion is that, yeah, it won't actually advance the, uh... <laughs> it's weird for the game to tell me that we spent three days sitting still, but the, the other trains that were in the room decided to also just sit there for three days and, and wait politely for us. All right, we made it back to Fargyle Keep. Let's take Cromlech to a poetry recital. This definitely won't make him want to kill. You explain the situation to the Poet Knights, and they agree to forgive Cromlech any impoliteness. He shouts and snarls at first, but as the poetry flows, and whiskey and laudanum with it, he quietens. By the end, Cromlech is in tears of joy. So beautiful, he sobs, blowing his nose noisily on the tablecloth. Okay, well that's like half a step up. Uh, okay, that's it. Are we good? Let's enter the castle, I guess? Oh, yeah, we'll spend an evening with the Poet Knights... Uh, we'll give him a glimpse of another world. We have so many, so many glimpses. He is utterly silent as you tell your story. When you are finished, he sighs. Thank you. He gazes into the roaring fireplace for a long time. Just as you think he has nodded off, he starts to speak. This new story is much darker than the others. A story of horrendous things he saw in his travels. Of dark deeds covered up. Of things he'd rather forget. And then he just bids you goodbye. Forgive the ramblings of an old man, he says with a smile. Very, very extremely normal. Okay, so I guess let's set back out and see if Cromlech's feeling any better? Nope, he has become a screaming feral recluse. Maybe we do have to take him to all of the cities. Yep, yeah, I guess so. Alright, well we're absolutely going to do it, but... It's probably going to have to be a tomorrow sort of thing, because we are very out of time for right now. So, thank you all so much for watching and coming on this increasingly weird, increasingly long journey with us. Come back next time tomorrow. We are going to save our fine friend here, and then maybe finally reach some kind of conclusion. And we'll see you then.